Hi Founder fans, Jason here. Welcome to our Sunday afternoon study hall. We will be studying the American Revolution by taking your questions. Now, I'm sure people are going to roll in a little bit slowly, so uh, to get started, uh, I did start doing a reading of the week each week, which I'm going to be putting out every Monday, uh, and this week was a reading about George Thatcher. And, uh, you know, you can join our Discord channel where I put the readings of the week, which, by the way, link in the description below. Check it out right now. They only last 24 hours, so if you're watching this in the future, you might not be seeing, uh, you might not have access to it, but feel free to email me or reach out to me in any fashion. I'll get you a link. Uh, we're building a cool little community. Actually, of note, we have a memes page, a memes section uh, where Ashley and Misfit are really killing it with some hilarious American Revolutionary War jokes. So uh, feel free to check that out or join our other channels where we have fun conversations. So I am going to pull this up real quick again as I'm waiting for you. Oopsie daisy, I did pull up the uh, my website itself. But uh, this reading was from Colonial Society of Massachusetts, uh, and it actually comes from a book uh, called The Insurgent Delegate which uh, gives an outline and then uh, selected readings of George Thatcher, who was an underappreciated American revolutionary, and, and I did write about him last Monday. So I will be going into more depth about George Thatcher this uh, Wednesday when we do our weekly review, the, the live wrap-up. Um, but the one thing I noticed that I wanted to point out, and it's down here somewhere, I believe it was Christopher Gore was writing to uh, a colleague about some of his, and it's way down here, about some of his uh, contemporaries in the Continental Congress. Here it is, uh, right above my head. Uh, yes, it is. He's writing to uh, Nathan Dane, who was a longtime Continental Congressman uh, from Massachusetts. And uh, he's discussing some of the people there, Theodore Sedgwick, Nathan Dane, uh, uh, Thatcher and Samuel Allen Otis, who are all major uh, important revolutionaries from Boston, especially Sedgwick, uh, who did wonderful things, uh, kind of led the fight on behalf of enslaved people to eliminate slavery in Massachusetts and proving that the Massachusetts Constitution of 1780, uh, in fact, did not permit slavery. Uh, Nathan Dane would go on to be the father of of American, uh, he's called the father of American jurisprudence. He would invest heavily in Harvard Law School as well as establish a, um, he'd write a series, I believe it was a nine volume series on the laws of the United States, uh, which became a staple of every lawyer's uh, library pretty much till today. Uh, and then Samuel Allen Otis, who was part of the Otis family, kind of the uh, more overlooked brother or sister of the Otis family, although he would do his part, and he did, uh, he was, uh, I believe, Secretary of Congress, of the House of Representatives, if I'm not mistaken. He was an early secretary. He had a, kind of a battle with uh, uh, Charles Thompson for the position for a while. Uh, but I wanted to draw attention here to Thatcher, who he calls a Hebrew. And I could not, I dug into this a little bit, I could not find a, why he called Thatcher a Hebrew. Now, Thatcher, as I will, again, get into detail on Wednesday about, Thatcher, uh, he wrote under several pseudonyms, and he wrote under one pseudonym um, uh, called a, a Reasonable Christian. And a Reasonable Christian, and I'll bring myself back up here, uh, a Reasonable Christian wrote basically about separation of church and state, and promoted the separation of church and state. Uh, this did call a little bit into question his... Uh, uh, how do you say, uh, not ferocity, but um, his enthusiasm for being a good Puritan Christian, as you might expect up in uh, New England at the time. Uh, the truth was he does seem to be a good, a, a good Christian, just a reasonable one, uh, who did not want the government involved in his religion, um, at least from his point of view. That seems to have made some people think he was Jewish. <laughs> but again, I could not find too much extra information on that. Uh, anyway... Um, hi, Ashley. Thank you for coming. Let me know if you have any questions uh, uh, for the four people here. Anyone with any questions? This is Study Hall. Uh, it's the only video I make where I come pretty much unprepared, <laughs> hoping to take your questions. So if you have anything to ask, now would be the time. Uh, again, I ran through George Thatcher. Um, we are excited to have uh, tomorrow's coming up um, an interview with Jesse Sir Filippi of the Schuyler Mansion. We'll be talking about uh, one of the ladies of the mansion, so to speak. And I'm not going to give too much away. I don't want to spoil it for you. Um, if anyone has a question or wants to hit like, although we're not talking about much right now, 
Uh, like I said, uh, the reading of the week is a little bit longer, but it's not a full book. So knock yourself out reading that um, new one tomorrow, where I believe we'll be talking this week about uh, the delegation sent to Rhode Island to say, hey, why aren't you paying for the war with everyone else? <laughs> Very excited for that. Um, and while I'm waiting for questions, oh, there's Matt. Will interviews be on Monday from now on? So that's a great question, Matt. I'm not entirely sure. Um, we pre-recorded this interview because I wanted to make sure all of my workings worked right. Uh, and it did seem to go swimmingly. Uh, and I'm just excited to get it out. I'm not entirely sure if interviews will be Monday or Thursday. I've started reaching out. I'm doing a lot more reaching out today. Um, depending on how many people start responding, uh, I, I think think interviews I'm deciding on whether or not to start making them live I know Matt you would said you would have been interested in hearing them live a few people have said that I would be interested in doing them live uh, so that might affect the day so this one's coming out on Monday I was thinking Thursday but going live Wednesday Thursday Friday might be a lot though to be fair I am also considering going live every day instead of doing my pre-recorded videos still keeping most of them pretty short but instead of doing a one take like I, you know I do my videos in one take and instead of just doing it in one take downloading it to my computer uploading it to YouTube I, I am considering just going live to YouTube to save half an hour of time for something that's one take anyway uh, and then it will give you guys the opportunity to ask questions on everyone uh, although I will again try and keep those super short bios like I've been doing so that being said I don't know, Thursday kind of feels right, but Mondays feels like a good day. Let me know, Matt. What, what do you guys think, Ashley, any, anyone watching? What, what do you think is the best day for me to be interviewing people? Uh, again, the, so the thing is about the interviews is the lengths might change. Like some people might come on and talk for just a few minutes about a really random founder, or someone might come on and we might talk about them for a while. You know, obviously I like to keep my videos under an hour. But, you know, instead of five to six minutes, they might end up being 20, 30 minutes, uh, depending on the founder, depending on, you know, if I ask good questions, <laughs> things of that nature. So, um, yeah, like I said, let me know what days you would like them to be on, because uh, I'm pretty open minded. The other thing, too, is if I do start doing them live at 815 Eastern, uh, a lot of that will fall on the guest. So, you know, if, you know, if I commit to Mondays, they might end up saying, hey, what about Wednesday, you know? Uh, Ashley, uh, but thank you for asking, Matt. Uh, Ashley, do you, do do I much, uh, do I know much about Elizabeth Freeman? Came across her briefly this week and wanted to know if you had some info on her. If not, from what I've heard about her, she might be a cool person to write about. I have written about Elizabeth Freeman. Uh, her name, uh, uh, Elizabeth Freeman was the name I, I believe she took on later in life. It's funny, I just mentioned Theodore Sedgwick and his work, uh, in Massachusetts he was Elizabeth Freeman was the uh, not defendant but the um, person who was suing the state for freedom that Theodore Sedgwick was defending uh, she went by the name mom bet when she was a slave she was uh, from Sheffield Massachusetts in Western Massachusetts uh, um, so here's an interesting thing I dug up. There's a few, uh, I'm gonna give you a little bit of backstory. I'm gonna tell, uh, and, and I hate to attach, you guys know that I hate to attach a woman or black person to their, you know, white male counterpart, so to speak. But what's interesting about Theodore Sedgwick and, and Elizabeth Freeman is they seem to be kind of a team. Uh, and so I like to tell their story together because Sheffield, Massachusetts and Western Massachusetts just before the revolution, uh, there was a, they had resolves. Just before the revolution, many towns would have their town meeting and st when they were starting their committee of correspondence and they would write a publication called a resolves where they said, this is what we believe in. And that was done at the Ashley house, probably done at the Ashley house for the Sheffield resolves. Uh, and the Sheffield resolves are one of the more popular resolves. Um, they have they use a lot of language that later gets reflected in the Declaration of Independence. If not directly, uh, it's not that um, it's not it's not that Thomas Jefferson ne necessarily read these resolves because these were sent to Boston and published in Boston. They also had an instruction for the Sheffield representative in the Colonial Assembly. That being said, the person who probably authored this 
the Sheffield Resolves at the Ashley House was a young Theodore Sedgwick. Interestingly enough, uh, one of the slaves at the free at the house was Elizabeth Freeman. Now, there is a very good chance. It's a bit of an assumption on my part, but there is a very good chance that this is where Theodore Sedgwick first met uh, Elizabeth Freeman. Because the only time I know, well, he was from that part of the area, so he might have been around there a little bit more. I can't confirm that, but they were certainly both on the property for the Sheffield Resolves. And again, Sedgwick probably wrote it, he signed it, and he was a, a major proponent of the uh, independence. And he would go on to be a, a United States congressman decades later. Um, but I bring this up because at the Ashley House, apparently um, uh, the, the, the lady of the house whose name escapes me, uh, Ashley was their last name. I forget all of their first names. I just remember Ashley was their last name. Uh, she was apparently really not uh, pleasant to the slaves. Uh, and and um, of course there was always violence. It's slavery. It's not acceptable. But uh, in New England, and especially in Massachusetts, uh, it was being harsh to your slaves was very much more looked down upon uh, than it was in certain parts of the South. Uh, throughout the colonies, slaves were generally looked at the same way women were, which was as children who needed to be taken care of. Uh, and abusing uh, your, your spouse or your servant or your children um, was not something you should be doing. You were supposed to be taking care of these uh, all of these people. Um, although, you know, strict discipline throughout, all the way down to the children, was not uncommon for a very long time in world history. Uh, apparently, Mrs. Ashley was especially, and not you, Ashley, <laughs> Mrs. Ashley in Sheffield, Massachusetts, was especially harsh to her slaves. Uh, and after the Massachusetts Constitution was published, uh, it was passed around, it was read in public, and apparently, now the details differ a little bit, but at some point, uh, Elizabeth Freeman heard the Massachusetts Constitution or, or read it, uh, probably heard it when it was being spoken in public. And she heard the phrase, and, and I forget the quote from the exact Massachusetts Constitution, I believe it's all people, are, all people are created equal. It might be all men are equal, are born equal and free. I think that's the quote. All men are born equal and free. And Elizabeth heard this and was like, all of us? <laughs> and she went into the office of a young Theodore Sedgwick, who at the time was already kind of known for his views on slavery and how he did not care for it. And they worked together uh, with another gentleman whose name escapes me, uh, another um, uh, slave. Uh, they worked together to bring the first freedom suit, as they were called, to the state of Massachusetts. Uh, and they won. They said, look, the Constitution says born free and equal. And they won. And this sparked a series of judicial decisions and appeals uh, that went through Cork Walker. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Matt. Uh, uh, so Cork Walker was involved with Elizabeth Freeman. And this sparked a series of appeals in court. Hi, Ginger. Thanks for coming. We're just talking about Elizabeth Freeman uh, and, and uh, uh, the abolition of slavery in Massachusetts. So, um, yeah, like I said, there were a bunch of court cases in a row, and eventually it goes to the Supreme Court of Massachusetts, where one of my favorites, uh, William Cushing, uh, as Chief Justice of the Court, uh, although several other justices on the court agreed, uh, that slavery, hey, no, it, it's illegal here. The Constitution says it's illegal here, and, and, and uh, of course, William Cushing's statement is kind of a sweeping gesture, uh, kind of a middle finger, if you will, at the idea of slavery. Um, and really, it is all because Elizabeth Freeman had the courage, as a slave, to step into a lawyer's office and say, I, did I just hear this right? Uh, that not only would she win her freedom, but all of the slaves in Massachusetts would win their freedom. Uh, and this was, it's, it's very interesting. Like I said, Massachusetts, because they already kind of had a negative view, a large portion of the population already had a negative view of slavery and um they already had uh there were not gigantic plantations like there were in other uh colonies for example the ashley plantation was one of the bigger plantations at least in western massachusetts and i think they had around 10 slaves which i know was you know it's owning people i'm not trying to downplay it or justify it in any fashion i'm just trying to give you a little perspective on like that's as big as the plantations got, uh, as opposed to if you were to go down south where there's hundreds of people on a plantation. 
Um, uh, furthermore, Mr. Ashley, actually, after the freedom suit, offers Elizabeth Freedom, for Elizabeth Freeman, uh, to come back to his plantation to work for pay. And she says no. Uh, and she actually ends up working for a while in Theodore Sedgwick's house uh, and helping to raise his children. And and uh, just to further that, so like you have about the same time in Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania's uh, trying to abolish, successfully would abolish slavery. Pennsylvania's its own thing because it was uh, always Quaker. So they were always about freedom and uh, it was always kind of a safer harbor. There were people with slaves in, in Pennsylvania, of course, um, but uh, Pennsylvania is kind of its own its own beast throughout the revolution. But Massachusetts is the heart of New England. Sorry, uh, Connecticut. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, with Boston being arguably the biggest city at the time in Massachusetts, I shouldn't even say arguably, it was the biggest city in New England. Um, uh, and, and a powerful state. It would be for a long time one of the most powerful states. So the fact that Elizabeth Freedom did have the cur I'm sorry, Elizabeth Freeman did have the courage to step into Theodore Sedgwick's office and ask this. It, 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 most states went through gradual emancipation. Massachusetts was like, sorry, too late. We already did it. Uh, and and, and the, what the point I was getting to is that fortunately, the um, Massachusetts society was already institutionally prepared for slaves to just kind of be freed. Um, and, and they were fairly easily integrated into society. Of course, that's not 100% true. You know, it's not like Massachusetts never had racism. It obviously did um, throughout the centuries, but, and, and there were slaves being traded at the port of Boston uh, up until this time. Uh, but what's interesting too is you have the neighboring states kind of having fallout from this. Like you look at New Hampshire. So New Hampshire, at, just as Elizabeth Freeman is petitioning, her state, you have Prince Whipple and 20 other slaves petitioning the state of New Hampshire saying, hey, this is, this is, <laughs> this is crap. <laughs> well, I, I don't know how to say it. I, I don't want to, I don't want to use cuss words on the channel, but, um, you know, you have slaves in, Mass in, in New Hampshire saying the same thing. Now, New Hampshire kind of tables the decision saying, you know, we want to get, <clears throat> excuse me, we, we've got to get through this war we're fighting here. Uh, you know, there's more pressing issues, you know, uh, for, you know, whether or not that's a, obviously the, there are people who would disagree that owning slaves is a more pressing issue. That's how they felt at the time. Um, but again, slaves, even in New Hampshire were arguably treated better than Massachusetts. Um, uh, and, and after they, I'm just rolling up my sleeves a little more, <laughs> after they, uh, they never, New Hampshire never actually outlaws slavery, but it also becomes kind of a hotbed, especially Portsmouth, um, for free black people to live. So even though it never outlaws slaves, and there are still slaves owned in New Hampshire, like real close to the Civil War, they, uh, that, they actually, the city has, builds a community of free people of the, you know, the Whipple family, um, uh, several other families, uh, gather there. Uh, the, of course, names are escaping me. Um, but yeah, so, so, and the same thing to a degree happens in Connecticut and Rhode Island. So this whole idea of, of, uh, anti-slavery and, and one of the, I guess I'm making this connection right now, I guess, and I don't talk a lot about the civil war here, but you know, by the time of the civil war, the North had primarily freed all their slaves primarily and the South had not. And I guess you could trace a lot of that too. Uh, Elizabeth Freeman walking into Theodore Sedgwick's office because, you know, Massachusetts, they kind of realized, whoopsie daisy, already freedom. <laughs> and New Hampshire, Connecticut, Rhode Island, all of New England just kind of follows suit gradually. Um, and then, you know, 10 years later, you have, again, at the same time, Pennsylvania is doing it. So you have New York in the middle uh, and New York you know, I guess 50, more like 15, almost 20 years later, ends up passing uh, their gradual emancipation laws, which I believe is what Pennsylvania did also. Um, and and in a way, you can trace the whole, I guess you could blame Elizabeth Freeman for the Civil War. <laughs> no, you can't. You can't. That's a joke. You, that's a joke. But she definitely had an interesting role in helping the North guide the North. Uh, great question, uh, uh, Ashley. Thank you so much. Uh, if anyone else has any questions, uh, feel free. That's what I'm here for. Uh, if anyone wants to like and subscribe, that's also great. <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you guys for coming. Anyone popping in? I'm here to take questions. This is one of the few 
days I don't uh, I, I don't really prepare much. This is your day. Uh, Matt with today. Yeah, actually, it is a really cool story. Uh, Matt, today is the Battle of Cowpens. Cowpens in the South. And, and, and uh, one of the more notable battles, as opposed to, as we talked about recently, uh, the South had a lot of skirmishes that are hard to quali quantify as battles. The Cow Battle of Cowpens was certainly a battle. Um, and I always, uh, what's the, uh, Camden, I always, in my mind, confuse Cowpens and Camden because they start with a C and I'm lazy. <laughs> um, I guess. Uh, Camden was very, very bad. Uh, Cowpens, I'm forgetting the details of. Uh, I believe that was a Benjamin? Just Benjamin? <laughs> you want me to talk about a Benjamin ginger? Uh, Cowpens, I believe, was a was a, basically a draw, right? Cowpens. I'm going to bring it up. I'm going to bring it up. Um, the town of Cowpens, South Carolina... Daniel Morgan. Oh, let me pull up my article here on Morgan. I think I know. I could talk a little bit about cow pens now that I've reminded. Today, today's Benjamin Franklin's birthday? Well, that's amazing. That's amazing. Well, happy birthday, Benny Franks. He was born in what? 6, 1709? Or 1707? 1706? I want to say 1709. He was an old man. Um... Right, so, yes. Okay, I can talk about the Battle of Cowpens. Now that I've reminded myself. Uh, 1706. Ah, I was so close. Old guy. Old guy, yeah. So that means in 1787, he was 81 years old at the Constitutional Convention. Did I do that math right? <laughs> yeah. Um, Morgan and Tarleton. So at the Battle of Cowpens, which what's really interesting, the Battle of Cowpens, thank you for reminding me, Matt. And thank me for looking it up because uh, the Battle of Cowpens is arguably the only strategically unique battle of the Revolutionary War. Most of the time, it was either dudes lining up and firing at each other or someone shooting from the hills. Your standard battle plan, you know, they would, you know, Washington or whatever general or, or commander would say, hey, go here and you attack from this flank and you go here and you attack from here. Daniel Morgan took advantage of the fact that militiamen were not well known uh, they were well known to be scared as opposed to the British regulars British regulars or French regulars or the Hessian soldiers they were soldiers and they would stand in the face of battle even to a degree especially after uh, uh, Baron von Steuben shows up and trains them like a real army the Continental Army even becomes better at this but militia were regular people like you and me who would go volunteer on the weekends until the war started and still were essentially volunteers. They weren't soldiers. They were farmers who took up their guns to fight. They were therefore very skittish and easily frightened. So, Daniel Morgan is famous for his riflemen. And at the Battle of Cowpens, he knows the British are about to arrive and he uses, he breaks his men up into three groups. The riflemen, the militia, and the continentals. And, <clears throat> excuse me, he puts them up on a small hill, and first, when the uh, British are approaching, he has the riflemen pick them off with their rifles, which they were so good at, because as we've said recently, uh, the rifles, the rifle was a new weapon uh, with its curved, uh, uh, the, the inside of the barrel was curved, so it would shoot bullets, kind of like you would throw a football, it would spiral, uh, which made it go farther and more accurate. So... First, Morgan puts up his Morgan's riflemen to pick them off as they're approaching. And the British will keep approaching. Uh, and then eventually, as they get too close, the riflemen scatter. And behind them, coming down the hill, are the militia. And the British start shooting, and the militia get scared and run away. But that was actually Morgan's plan. You see, they ran away around the sides of the hill, passed each other, and came back the other side of the hill. But what the British saw was the riflemen run away, and then the militia run away. And they start running up the hill, and the Continental Army shows up. But, you know, they already, the British feel like they're winning the battle, so they get disorganized and out of their lines as they're storming up and fighting the Continentals. But 
the militia come back around both sides of the hill and the riflemen come around the hill also and suddenly these British who were so pumped to be winning the, the fight, they've gotten disorganized and now they're pretty much surrounded and they are defeated. <laughs> and it's a pretty harrowing loss because as, as Matt pointed out, it's Bannister Tarleton who, although I believe he was only a a colonel, I don't think he was even a brigadier general, uh, but he was an extremely important person for Cornwallis fighting in the south. Uh, Tarleton was known for his, uh, although it was a little overblown, his violent tactics, uh, he was known for running through and just destroying the Patriots. Uh, I, the, the, the Battle of Cowpen severely weakens the British. So the following year, uh, when the Battle of Yorktown happens, it's, you know, they were certainly, you know, you can't give credit for winning the war to Morgan in this one battle, uh, but the British were extremely weakened when they were uh, surrounded at Yorktown. Yeah, I'm glad I checked, because I always, I always, uh, uh, want to make sure I'm talking about the right battles. Uh, let's see. Uh, didn't it take long to reload the rifle? Uh, Matt, I don't actually know the answer to that question. Um, I think it... You know, Michael Troy at the AMREV podcast, I forget which episode, did talk about the rifles and them coming around. Uh, I think he mentioned something about it. It took a while to load all these guns. I don't know. I think the rifles... Oh, because the curve? Because the curve. So... How they get that? That's a great question. You know what, Matt? I am going to look into that question this week, and I'll, I'll bring it back up next week. Uh, there is someone uh, I, I I think on Instagram, which I'm not great on Instagram. Sorry if you're trying to contact me there. I'm hardly ever on. Uh, I think there is someone over there who musket and muzzle or something to that nature. Uh, I'm going to reach out to them and see if they can help me figure that out. Thank you for asking. Uh, I'm going to take a sip of water. Uh, if there are any other questions. Or, or birthdays or something like that to talk about. I was actually thinking about Ben Franklin Lock last week. I, I, I was, I'm considering um, doing a brief series on uh, what I call the Big Six, who are uh, Washington, Franklin, Hamilton, Madison, Jefferson, Adams, not nearly in that order. Um, uh, and I was thinking about going through each of their lives and, and how they relate to each other. Um, it might be a little bit of a longer series, but I was thinking about... I was actually thinking about doing that on Mondays. You know, I said I was talking, thinking about going live <laughs> more frequently because, you know, what's weird about the algorithm on YouTube is those of you who watch this and watch me live, some of you might get it, but most of you don't actually... YouTube doesn't tell you about my pre-recorded videos, and most of my people who watch my pre-recorded videos, YouTube doesn't tell them about the live videos. So I'm kind of playing to two audiences, and, and, it, and it stinks, but... Uh, that's why I was considering just doing the live so we can bring everyone under the same banner. Uh, Ginger, you think that would be interesting? Yeah, what I was thinking about doing, first I was thinking about writing a book, and then I was like, I don't have time for that. Let's just talk about it. Uh, what I was thinking about doing is like doing them by um, date of birth. So basically like going through, spending an episode to go through a very brief overview of the life of Ben Franklin. And then the second episode would be, you know, George Washington was born next. So do a brief overview of the life of Washington at during which I say, and here's where he met Franklin, and I'll use the previous discussion about Ben Franklin to elaborate on the American Revolution through George Washington. So they'll talk about the life of John Adams and be like, okay, here he's, and then here he ran into George Washington, here he ran into Franklin, blah, 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 blah. Although, to be fair, I think the best way to go about it, I've been thinking about this for several nights after I close off and I go, like, take a break. I'm like, of course, still thinking about <laughs> the American Revolution. Uh, I think the best way to do, to do something like that would be to do Ben Franklin and then do Washington Adams, Jefferson, uh, Madison Hamilton up until Ben Franklin's death. So through the Constitution, essentially. And then go back and do those last five through, like, again. But the second half of each of their lives. Although that's a broad, you know, Washington would only live ten more years, but you know, go through the first few administrations and the actual creation of the Republic. So let me know if that would interest you. Uh, they would probably be a little bit longer <laughs> than a regular videos, but, you know, probably 15 minutes to half an hour. 
Ginger thinks it would be interesting. Great, Ginger. I'll do it for you. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, like I said, any questions? This is your day. This is our, our study hall hangout. Make sure you hit like. Uh, I see some of you hanging around. I mean, literally anything. You want me to ask me about the books on my shelf? <laughs> like, uh, I am happy to discuss. Uh, the only thing I will be gentle with is modern politics. As you, as you know, I don't care to bring that into this conversation. Uh, it's actually with these interviews coming up that I have. I've been a little nervous about how to make sure my guests don't discuss the... <laughs> to be fair, everyone I'm talking to is very... Uh, mind in the 18th century and early 19th century so I'm not really concerned about it but you know eventually what boat what boot am I reading <laughs> what book am I reading right now um to be honest I am reading where did it go I don't know where it went it disappeared it's gone uh, I have just pretty much finished the Gallatin book that I was struggling through for so long. Um, and now I am... Oh, here it is. I am reading this that was sent to me by a lovely viewer um, and reader of my articles. Uh, um, uh, who, it was uh, uh, Adam Lewis. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lewis. Uh, Washington and His Generals by he Head, Headley. Ugh, can't talk. Um, yeah, I guess it's an old library book. I still have his note in here. Uh, it's a little, it's a little bit beat up. Uh, and, and it's interesting because this book was actually pu first published in the 1840s. I don't think this is a copy from 1840s, but it is a super old copy. Uh, I, I am a little, I was a little uh, saddened to see there's no publication date in it. Uh, again, no fault of Mr. Lewis. Thank you so much for sending this to me. Um, uh, it was two volumes, but it seems to have been consolidated into one volume. I think this was put out in the 1950s because, or, or between the like 30s and 50s, because there's like a, a and I don't think you can see this, but uh, a Burt's Home Library. It's like, uh, I don't even know how to call it. Some kind of advertisement. Um, but yeah, it's, not all the generals, but it's a giant slew of generals. I'm not even going to hold it up. You can't see it. But it's uh, it's got a little bit on Washington. Then it's the like, short biography of Putnam, Montgomery, Arnold, Stark, Sch Schuyler, Gates, Steuben, Wayne, Conway, and Mifflin, Ward, and Heath, uh, Green, Moultrie, Knox, Lincoln, Lee, Clinton, Sullivan, St. Clair, Brigadier General Marion, back to Major General Sterling, Lafayette, DeCobb, uh, Thomas, and McDougal. Wooster, Howe, and Parsons, Commodore Paul Jones, which I assume is John Paul Jones, uh, and Brigadier General Morgan. It's 500 pages. Uh, I look very, very much forward to this. Um, no, I did not throw away the jacket. It's a hardcover, although it could be thrown away if I wanted it to. How dare you, Matt? That was a, it was a horrifying moment of my childhood. I was in my mid-20s, but whatever. <laughs> Uh -huh. Ashley, oh, 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 how about I throw it on the ground? How about I throw it on the ground out of anger? I'll put it over here because uh, I can actually put it there. Um, I was actually about to ask what books. Do you have any book recommendations for Jefferson, for Thomas Jefferson? Yeah. <laughs> um, I buy most of my books online used. Yeah, that's a good thing. Uh, I think you can get, I think Amazon sells them online used also. Um, there's always places to do it. There's always the library, uh, for sure. So, Ashley, I guess my question to you would be, uh, what, what type of Jefferson would you like to learn about? There's the, um, I'm, I'm going to pull something up here while I talk, because there's like, you know, full biographies. Little Jefferson. I forget the name of it. Uh, book. Um, there are people who specify throughout his life. He's, he's an amazingly complex person uh, with so many things uh, throughout his life. Um, I'm going to pull up Amazon. Why talk? Um, that people, there are so many great authors who have really narrowed down very interesting topics. Uh, Uh, 
where is it? So I'm going to pull this up. This is going to probably shock most of you. Uh, these Who Was Thomas Jefferson books, they're for kids. They have Who Was Everyone books. They have them about literally probably every founder. Like, even if you scroll down on Amazon here, it's like, here's Washington, here's Hamilton. <laughs> like, um, these are, what's very interesting about these is they are for, like, young, young adults. Like, probably 12, 13-year-olds. But they are, um, they're accurate. So if you just want to know a, 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 a general idea of Thomas Jefferson's life, that will take you 20 minutes and you'll get the idea. Um, now, it's not the, you know, it's a little bit, I'll say, uh, below what we're doing here. <laughs> um, uh, but focus on his time as Secretary of State. Interesting. So early in the George Washington administration. Uh, amazing. Uh, listen to those tracks in the Hamilton play. <laughs> it's, it's a surprisingly good uh, this, uh, uh, spot there. Now, forgive me for turning around. I don't know if it's behind me. Um, there is a book, and it's probably downstairs. Um, uh, it's about Hamilton. Is it downstairs? It's about Hamilton and Jefferson. Hamilton and Jefferson. Um, I actually got it in when I was in college. Uh, it was one of my required readings. Now, there are a lot. Like, anything you Google Hamilton versus Jefferson is good. Um... But there is one, and the name, the name precisely is escaping me. Um, oh, man. Jefferson. I, and there's I, just a ton of Jefferson books back here. <laughs> um, uh, um, Barbary Pirates. Uh, a bunch of things about the Louisiana Purchase back here. <laughs> um, uh founders no it's a sh it's it's a, it's a smaller book um oof it's bugging me it is bugging me i'll tell you what at the end of this ashley uh before i go i'll run downstairs and see if it's down there because um I, and i'll pop you know what i will pop up what i'm doing here while i look <sighs> is it jefferson verse hamilton No, Marilyn, no. No. No, no, no. It's really bugging me. Ah, I see some other questions coming in. Um, Jefferson grows a nation. Yes, that's a good one. Uh, we're one month past Deborah. Uh, Deborah Sampson? Her birthday? Is that what you're referencing? Uh, Hamilton Jefferson Manufacturer try this Deborah Sampson's birthday yeah December 17th okay any thoughts on women serving well tomorrow we have Jesse Sir Filippi coming on to talk about uh, and you know I'll pull me back up Oops, someone's bringing in some wood I don't know if you heard that bang um that's all right don't worry ginger uh, uh, so tomorrow we have Jesse Sir Filippi coming on to talk about the Schuyler family but she was the first person to be a guest back when I was using my telephone to shoot this and zoom was doing all the work <laughs> Uh, back in June, she came out and she talked at length about Deborah Sampson. Excuse me. Um, so definitely search the search my page for for that discussion because she, uh, she's a wealth of knowledge on Deborah Sampson. She's written about Deborah Sampson in a book called Fierce, which was uh, a set of biographies of of um, essentially strong women throughout the Amer American history. Uh, and Deborah Sampson's really interesting. She dressed in drag, basically, for lack of a better term, uh, fought in the war. Uh, it seems to be that she was doing it for the money uh, because she was broke and needed cash. Um, she actually gets found out by a doctor and then um, uh, Major General, he ends up moving like an hour south of where I live now. Um, uh, I'll pull that up too. I'm going to search his name because it's really going to bug me, Samson. Um, uh, do 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 do. Um, John Patterson realizes she's a woman and and lets her. He kind of says, "Okay, well, you need to step aside here. We, now that I know you're a woman, you can't serve anymore." But she did really great work. She was wounded on several occasions, uh, so he didn't just write her off. He kind of asked her politely to step to the side so no one else would find out. Um, 
And she ends up going to, you know, after the war, she ends up having someone publish her biography and she does like a speaking tour about being a woman in the continental armies. Super. She's a super interesting character. Um, ah, oh, man, I can't, and, ah, oh, it's really bothering me that I can't remember the name of this. Je I just reread it. I just reread it like five or six months ago. Um, and it, this is not nearly my entire library. Um, if you watch like my super old videos from like right when I started, I was doing it downstairs. Realized couldn't do that and have other people live in the house. <laughs> That's why I moved up here. But uh, you, you'll see those old videos. I have like my bookshelf behind me. I'm also talking super quiet and they're not very good. <laughs> in fact, we were talking about Nathan Dane before. I probably owe him a redo. Hamil uh, Jefferson. I'll do Jefferson first. Jefferson Hamilton. Uh... Yeah, Ashley, you'd really like it. Uh, like I said, d check out the video that I do with um, uh, uh, Jesse. Just look up my interview section. There's only like five of them I've done so far. Now it's easy to search. Um, uh, Jefferson Hamilton. No, that's not going to do it. The Rivalry of the Forge Nation. Yeah, it's popular to write about now. Oh. Well, okay, I forgot. I'm going to pull this up. I don't want to give you guys radio silence. So I found this book, Jefferson Hamilton in the Washington Administration by Carson Holloway. Um, completing the founding or betraying the founding. Uh, again, I can't speak to this book. I don't know if it's... it's the title sounds a little biased. Um, to be honest, uh, nope. The Rivalry, the Forge of the Nation, like... I do believe I have read a John Furling book before, so I, this one should be good. I don't recall. I don't recall what Furling wrote. Nope. Whoopsie Daisy. Whoopsie Daisy. Um, where is his name? Down here. Oh, I think I, I think I have read a Furling book. Yes, I read Apostles of Revolution a while ago, a while ago. Now that talks a lot about the French Revolution as well, and they're kind of overlapping. Um, yeah, uh, this one will probably be good. Again, I have not read this book, um, but it might be a good place to start if you're looking for the Washington administration. Uh, oh, you know what else is good? And this is an earlier book called Founding Brothers by Joseph J. Ellis. Now this is the introduction, here it is. I probably, I think I spoke about it recently. This is like the introduction book to the American Revolution. Uh, anyone who wants to learn um, a lot about it, and it, it, actually this book, I had read this book when I first started enjoying the American Revolution, and then I like changed my major to history, uh, and then this was the first class I took, this was one of the required readings. <laughs> and I had like just read it that summer, which I, I was super pumped about. Um, and it's it's the best introduction. It talks about the, I think, seven uh, moments in American history that make the revolution really uh, unique, like actual six chapters. The generation is the preface, the duel, the dinner, the silence, the farewell, the collaborators, the friendship. Um, and in it, they do talk a lot about the, like, uh, one of the chapters is the dinner. And that talks a lot about specifically uh, the room where it happened, that song, uh, this talks about that. Although, again, we can never really know what happened in there. Um, as for Thomas Jefferson in general, yeah, I have a lot of Jefferson books downstairs. <laughs> uh, there's always, you can always grab a, no, this is a, one of my favorites, Light, Light and Liberty. This is just a quote book for Jefferson. Ginger, his handwriting was amazing when you read back through some of these people. Uh, some of them are really hard to read. Others are fairly easy. Um, yeah, I'm really sorry I can't remember the name of that book. I'm, I'm really embarrassed by it. And, like, I know the topic, it's it's really short, which is nice, because he, he really sums up the, uh, the, the, the disagreements that they were having. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, can't, I'm kind of surprised it's not coming up. Although, I guess this one's being sponsored, so this is obviously a newer one that they want you to buy. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, first principle. No, 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 no. Uh, you know, I want to say I'll know it if I see the cover, though at the same time, they might have come up with a new color now because it's been a few decades. I'm going to look at one more page and then give up. Um, yeah, Ashley, for sure. Like I said, I'll, it's downstairs. So I'll go downstairs, I'll grab it, and I'll put it up on the... Um, I'll put it up on the, uh, the the Discord channel, which, by the way, anyone who's popping in who's new here, although probably not because I'm just basically going through the internet. <laughs> anyone who's new here, we have a great, uh, we've started a Discord channel. There's a link in the description below if you want to hang out with other fans of the American Revolution and talk about the revolution and or um, uh, uh, look at cool memes because Ashley and Miss Bitter are putting up some really great American Revolution memes down there. It's a lot of fun. Uh, yeah. And I'm sorry, I got a little distracted. I'm really angry at myself that I can't remember the title of the book. Um, but yeah, that's... I will get it to you. Don't worry. <laughs> because there's a lot of interesting things that happen right off the bat. You know, you're looking at... Um, Jefferson comes home. Again, this is kind of what I want to talk about in that other... Uh, thing I was talking about, but Jefferson comes home, as does John Adams, to the Constitution already having been written, and they are, he's a little bit like, what? What are you guys doing here? <laughs> um, and so he's kind of feeling that out immediately going into the, the Washington administration as Secretary of State. I know I've already said it like three times now, but thank you. I've wanted to go more into Jefferson's politics after reading a lot about Hamilton. It's funny, that's what, I, I did the opposite <laughs> when I started Founder of the Day, I started studying Hamilton a lot more because I knew a lot about Jefferson. Je it's, Jefferson's really interesting. Their debates are, are, are amazing because they're at the highest level and the Constitution was just written and Jefferson kind of comes home and is like, what do you, what do you mean? <laughs> what are you doing here? Uh, you know, James Madison, what have you done? What, what did you let Hamilton trick you into? So uh, there's one of the big debates is about manufacturing Hi, Texas Renegade. Hamilton sucks. Okay, no comment. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, as I said recently, you know, a lot of what happens today, someone asked last week, uh, what would Jefferson think if he was around today? And he would think we live in Hamilton's America. You know, Alexander Hamilton wanted to take out a national debt uh, as a means of stimulating the economy. He wanted the government to very particularly stimulate the economy. Now, for him, that was uh, helping stimulate the banks he just created and the um and the uh uh the stock market he just created uh and uh you know they when i said manufacturers the industrial revolution was setting in and they saw this and they saw factories coming around and hamilton wanted to push for that uh, jefferson was a little bit more of a reactionary he didn't want the government to take out debts he wanted the government to pay off its debts uh he also wanted uh, what was called yeoman farmers. He he wanted most people because again during the American Revolution at this time, well into the 1800s, most people were farmers. Easily 80, if not 90 percent of all people were farmers. Um, and Jefferson liked this. Excuse me. <coughs> Jefferson liked this. By the way, thanks for coming, Texas Renegade. Make sure you like and subscribe. We talk about the revolution all week long. Usually I'm more prepared. This is the one video that's uh, asked me anything as opposed to uh, American founders that I've prepared for. Um, uh, Hamilton, uh, where was I? Jefferson wanted what was called yeoman farmers. He wanted people to take responsibility for themselves, essentially, and he envisioned a future on this great continent full of people who had little plots of land where they could take care of themselves, uh, you know, grow their own food on their farm, primarily make their own stuff, uh, sell a little bit, either do a little work on the side or do some, uh, you know, grow some extra of, of food to sell at market uh, and use that to pay some taxes and to buy some goods. And if everyone fell into this line, with the exception, there would, of course, be cities. There would, of course, be artisans doing blacksmithing and all of that. But primarily, people would be, you know, on their own to just live in the world as they saw fit. Uh, and Hamilton saw more of a greater uh, society. Uh, if, if there was anyone in the American Revolution who had empire in the mind, it probably would have been Alexander Hamilton. Uh, you know, he wanted a big, strong military. He wanted lots of money for the country. 
Uh, Hamilton was essentially, and this is this is again a kind of a generalization, but Hamilton was basically a nation first person, uh, while while Jefferson seems to have been more of an individual first person. Um, not that there isn't middle ground you can find there, but uh, and they and they try to, you know. Uh, that's what's so interesting about the dinner itself, the the dinner. Uh, the room where it happens, as they say in the play. Uh, you have Jefferson and Hamilton kind of meeting. Uh, that's how basically how it was until Shay's Rebellion. Yeah, okay, that's a good point, Matt. So Shay's Rebellion in Massachusetts, uh, as well as a few others. There was a Groton Rebellion in Massachusetts also. Uh, at the same time as the Shay's Rebellion, there was the paper money riots happening up in uh, in North uh, New Hampshire. Uh, and, you know... Essentially, they were the states were separate countries. The, the United States was more or less the League of Nations. They, uh, they were it was a, a firm league of friendship, as uh, one founder once put it. Uh, and some people saw this as a problem. First of all, the United States, this trade union—that's <laughs> not the right word—but this, you know. Um, the United States was essentially just a handshake deal for a mutual trade and protection, but they owed a lot of money from the Revolutionary War. And, you know, you have Shays' Rebellion where the states are having trouble raising the money from the people in the states, and they're not really sending any of the money to pay off the debt by the Congress. Well, one of the many reasons that Hamilton and, and others wanted the Constitution was, well, to make it one tight nation um, and to suppress these kind of rebellions because people got to pay their taxes if we want to if we want to have a, a government here um, and to uh, uh, stimulate uh, the the trades within uh, to make make more money for the United States itself you know you look at one of the most overlooked meetings of the American Revolution is called the Mount Vernon conference and that happened two years before the Constitution and a year before the Annapolis Convention. And it was a meeting of people at from Maryland and people from Virginia met at George Washington's house. They all, this is just after the war ends, and they want to improve the Potomac River. They were all about getting the land out in the Ohio Valley and finding a way to transport goods to and from there. Because if you could dominate that trade, your generations of your family would be extremely wealthy. And the Mount Vernon Conference, they had these two meetings come together and they came to an agreement. Okay, you're going to fix your side of the river. We're going to fix up our side of the river. Great. And then they took their agreement and went back to their separate state governments. And then the separate state governments individually approved the plan. And then they started working together. But the idea that came, and it's called the Mount Vernon Conference, because even though he wasn't a delegate, it ended up being at George Washington's house. Uh, I know James Madison was one of the delegates there, too. And they kind of said, well, why are we going to separate governments to approve this plan and having these, like, treaty negotiations, for lack of a better term? Why don't we just have one government that improves boundaries and borders of this nature on its own? You can agree with that or not. That was the outlook uh, by George Washington and many of the other people who called the Constitutional Convention. Not all of them. Some people were very surprised at what they were talking about when they arrived in Philadelphia at the Constitutional Convention. But uh, that was one of the main arguments. So that's And that covers the like manufacturers and stimulating economy that would fall into the Interstate Commerce Clause later on. So like I said, just to reiterate, we have that. We have stopping insurrection from within to control the people. Uh, they have raising money uh, to pay off the debts. And then this is, again, I got a little off topic, but this is where the the Hamilton and Jefferson debates come in. Because, you know, Jefferson comes home and Hamilton had already pushed for writing this constitution. Uh, and, and, and the national debt is a very important one because Hamilton liked the idea of having the debt. He wanted to take out more debt. Now, I'm not an economist and it is very difficult for me to understand some of what Hamilton says, it is very, it, as, as I read in this book, as I've been going on and on about for months now, if I can get it, Jefferson's Treasure, this is a biography of Albert Gallatin, who would be Secretary of Treasury for Thomas Jefferson for his entire presidency and into James Madison's presidency. This man was in the United States House of Representatives while Alexander Hamilton was pushing his policies on the... Um, 
all, all sorts of treasury policies. And what I learned in this book is that it's hard for me to understand what they're talking about because it was hard for everyone else to understand what they're talking about. Like him or not, Alexander Hamilton was a brilliant economic thinker to the point where he would write these laws, he would publish explanation for these laws, and only a handful of the smartest economic thinkers at the time would be able to understand what he was saying. Gallatin could not only understand what he was saying, but then translated to the, the Democratic Republican Party that emerged and said, here's what you're angry at. <laughs> and, um, so he was like one of those people, almost like Neil deGrasse Tyson is with, with science nowadays, where he could take these really complicated uh, economic ideas and explain them in a way that most people could understand. Um, but uh, Hamilton wanted to assume these debts. He wanted to assume the debts of the states and create more of a national debt because the only way you can build credit is if you take out debt. It's the same idea now is like if you're a young uh, younger person and you take out a credit card uh, and you want to establish credit. You know, you can buy things on the card and pay it off every month and that'll, you know, you'll build your credit. That's more or less what Hamilton wanted to do um, on a larger scale, uh, especially with countries like the Netherlands and, in, in a way, Britain, which was another argument they had. Excuse me, the whole, like, do we like Britain or do we like France argument, which um, <laughs> George, I, I shouldn't say, I was going to say George Washington basically said neither, but that's not true. George Washington was more along the lines of the British, um, and that's why the Constitution reflects... Uh, Great Britain's Constitution more than the United States Constitution. I know I talked in a little bit of circles there. I, I tend to when I get uh, to the the Hamilton Madison debates because there's so m I'm sorry Hamilton Jefferson debates because there's so much they disagreed on. Um and 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 also they didn't really know each other. They may have met once or twice over the years, um in Philadelphia, but Hamilton spends his first part of his career at war. And then by the time Hamilton goes to Continental Congress, Jefferson has become governor and then kind of resigns and then goes to France. Um, so they didn't really know each other very well. Unlike Madison, and who knew Jefferson for years, he was mentored by Jefferson in many ways. And then he also spent about a decade in the Continental Congress with Hamilton and then writing the Constitution with Hamilton and then writing the Federalist Papers with Hamilton. Uh, it's a very interesting dichotomy. Like I said, that's the I'm thinking about doing that new series, and, and I was going to take them one at a time to introduce that uh, because these relationships between these significant leaders are uh, integral to understanding the American Revolution. And here at Founder of the Day, where we like to look at the more obscure American founders, uh, I, I found myself overlooking those heads of states, so to speak, uh, to a large degree, and and uh, hopefully I can remedy that. Of course, they always come up in conversations. They're always there, uh, and that's why I was thinking about doing these <coughs> series of episodes where I elaborate on them a little bit because uh, it's important to remember that they're there <laughs> and important to know their stories so that you can put them in the greater picture of the American Revolution. So uh, we're about wrapping up here. Usually keep it to about an hour. Uh, any last questions? Now's the time. Uh, again, I'm sorry if I talk a little bit in circles there. Um, it made sense in my mind as I was saying it. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I'm always happy to answer a few more questions. I Make sure you like and subscribe. There's a link to our Discord channel where we're always talking about the revolution over there. Um, and if there's nothing else coming in, then that is exactly one hour. And uh, that should be good. So tomorrow, uh, as I said, I got the pre-recorded interview class dismissed thanks matt i got the pre-recorded interview with jesse schuyler uh jesse schuyler jesse sir Filippi from the schuyler mansion uh, who is saved in my phone is jesse schuyler and i told her i would screw it up at least once and call her jesse schuyler uh jesse sir Filippi from the schuyler mansion uh and it's cool we're going to talk about some of the schuyler family hamilton's in-laws um and from there lots of other videos all the time you guys know we're talking about the american revolution here uh, thank you guys for coming. I don't know if we came up with a sign-off. Is that what you're saying, Matt? Should that be our sign-off? Is class dismissed? I suppose. I have no uh, education licensing to really say that, but I'll say it. Hell yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> thanks ginger thank you everyone for coming i really appreciate you guys like i said if you if you just signed up this is your first one i'm much better prepared for my other videos this is just the kind of hangout i answer your questions as i can uh so definitely subscribe if you like the american revolution uh thank you again and i guess uh class